Now, let me introduce you all to the resource speaker for today. Madam Geeta Gopi N is a rehabilitation practitioner and a psychologist. She's the director of professional development programs at Shashak Pikaran Trust, Kochi, with over 30 years of experience in helping children with special needs. She's worked in international schools following an American curriculum for inclusive settings primarily for more than 15 years. She's done intensive work in curriculum development, adaptations, behavioral management, coordinating and promoting best educational practices using universal design for learning principles among staff and parents. She's also launched an early academic series, a Teachers kit for teaching early English language skills and basic math based on universal design for learning. It's a pleasure and privilege to have you here with us today, ma'am. Before I hand over the podium to you, I'd like to inform all our members that the current session would be for two hours. The session would begin with a presentation of a by the speaker, followed by a Q&A discussion. Uh, during the presentation, the chat would be switched to the host and the panelist mode so that we can all focus on the speaker sharing. Wish you all a happy learning. Kita ma'am, do I have you with me? Yes. Over to you ma'am. We're all excited to learn more about blending, segmenting and spelling skills and the tricks from you. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to all the participants and uh, thank you Ability for the platform once again. Uh, without much ado, I'll just uh, straight away go to my presentation. <clears throat> Yeah, today's uh, topic is blending, segmenting, and spelling skills to enhance reading fluency. So today we are, we had kind of dealt with this pre in our previous uh, workshop also. Uh, what we did in the previous workshop was we looked at what are reading skills, what the importance of reading skills in holistic development of uh, literacy skills, the importance of um, uh, you know, phonological awareness, sight word recognition, et cetera, and how it contributes to better reading skills. And we had also had a look at <clears throat> multisensory activities, which would help uh, promote phonological awareness and uh, recognition of sight words in children with uh, special needs. So today we are going to take this a step further, and we're going to further look at reading in, in a bit more detail uh, while looking at the unique challenges faced by children. Uh, and uh, earlier we had started off with just alphabet phonics and you know CVC words, but today we are going to go a bit further and look at more, uh, more of the phonic and sight word elements and how to develop better reading fluency in children. <clears throat> and definitely uh, when we look at uh, children with special needs, we need to explore the different kinds of uh, strategies and techniques that will help develop this reading fluency. <clears throat> so just to do a quick uh, recap of what is reading, it is a very basic skill which helps us to look for, find, as well as to convey information. It is a receptive skill. We uh, once When we read, we receive the information and uh, reading or the prerequisites to reading starts developing at a very young age, even prior to preschool age, the fundamentals of what will later on contribute to reading starts developing at that age. So let us look at what is the process of reading. Reading is a process that helps us to identify either the letters, the phonetic elements, or the, or the different uh, word, uh, the letter combinations that make the words. It helps us to decode this, uh, the symbols that are that what is written in uh, written or printed as text. And through the process of being able to decode this, it helps us to understand what is the information given in the text. So therefore, it is a very cognitive process. It's a very active process where we not only decode the symbols that are given in the written or printed text matter, but we also uh, comprehend it or derive a certain kind of meaning that goes with those words, vocabulary, or printed matter. So why do we have to build uh, reading skills? So uh, the importance of building reading skills is it provides mental stimulation and improves cognitive, different kinds of cognitive processes. When we did talk about cognitive processes in some of the earlier workshops, we had talked about attention, perception, thinking, 
all the uh, memory, all these are important cognitive processes which contribute to learning. And reading is an activity which stimulates all these different uh, cognitive processes and therefore it helps um, stimulate our mental faculties and improves processing information in a more effective manner. So reading is actually a tool which also helps to further enhance these cognitive processes. Reading is also uh, a tool which helps us to enhance our knowledge. It helps us to increase our knowledge by reading up on a particular topic. So therefore it facilitates learning and is therefore a very uh, essential study skill, especially when you learn how to read in the early parts of the schooling years, as you go higher up the grade levels, uh, the subject content matter uh, actually increases and therefore by then you start reading to learn the different kinds of uh, con uh, content matter. So uh, basically with reading what happens is it facilitates uh, acquiring knowledge and it facilitates learning and study skills. Uh, because reading is very intensively oriented with words and language and literacy, therefore it also enhances our vocabulary. So the, our word power or our understanding of different kinds of words to express different kinds of thoughts and ideas, that also gets enhanced through uh, reading. Besides, uh, uh, other than all these, uh, uh, all these uh, important facets of reading, it also helps to uh, and has a positive impact on written expression. If you can read well, if you can comprehend well, if you have a good vocabulary, if you have good processing skills that are associated with reading, then it has a good positive impact on your written expression as well. So when you are trying to write or you express your thoughts and ideas in the form of writing or by printing, uh, reading is the precursor that actually uh, positively contributes to improving uh, creative writing or expressive writing skills. Other than all this, reading also provides relaxation and entertainment. So you can read for enjoyment, you can read for uh, relaxation. It can be cultivated as a good hobby as well. So reading stories or reading about a particular topic that you would like to delve into, all this provides a lot of um, enjoyment, entertainment and relaxation. So reading has a wide ranging uh, impact on our uh, everyday life. So therefore it is very important to build reading skills in children. And when we look at a considerable amount of research that has gone into this area, we find that experts uh, from say the National Center for Early Childhood Development and Teaching, they explain that reading books help children to expand the number of um, not only the number of words that they use, but the variety of words they use and, and how they use these words in different kinds of contexts. So definitely has a great impact on vocabulary. A child's ability to read words um, using uh, uh, segmenting, blending, and all these associated strategies which help in word decoding uh, helps them to become proficient readers. So, you know, enhances their reading fluency. So there are different studies which show, uh, like by, uh, the a study by Christine Hall in 2015, the National Reading Panel in 20, 2000, all these are uh, constantly pointing towards how uh, we have to incorporate blending and segmenting strategies while designing reading intervention for children with uh, reading challenges and uh, which ultimately helps in improving reading fluency. So basically to look at what exactly are the different facets that we have to concentrate on when we work on reading. One is word recognition, which we uh, already did talk about a bit in our previous workshop. Then it's comprehension, it is understanding. Again, reading uh, comprehension has to go hand in hand with word recognition. And then last but not the least, fluency. Uh, fluency is when you can uh, put together the word recognition as well as the comprehension aspect and read with a fair amount of um, speed and accuracy. So that, uh, that is what reading fluency is all about. So when we look at word recognition, it is uh, the ability to understand the printed or written matters and generally too widely, uh, you know, uh, 
researched and widely uh, used strategies are uh, enhancing phonological awareness as well as whole word reading, which uh, enable better word recognition. And then comprehension, it involves multiple amount of uh, different kinds of processing where you understand uh, or comprehend what is uh, what the words or the sentences or the written text is saying. And then of course the fluency whereby you're able to read at a, a required uh, speed with a fair amount of um, errorless reading so that uh, what you're reading makes sense to yourself as well as to others. So when we are uh, teaching learning to read, especially in the early part of uh, schooling years, the primary years in particular, we are uh, teaching uh, children how to read and therefore they're learning how to read, how to do word decoding, how to do word recognition and so on. So some of the key skills that are required for enabling word recognition is, one is phonic skills. And in phonics, uh, phonic is basically letter sound association. And in phonic skills, uh, blending, blending means putting together letter sounds or letter combinations and to read or decode a word and which we popularly call as sounding out the word. So basically you use the letter sounds, put them together and to and sound out or read the word. Segmenting is just the opposite process where you have a word and then you're splitting it up into its individual words, into uh, the individual sounds as you listen to them, individual phonemes. So uh, segmenting again helps us to be more aware of what sounds constitute a word and so on. Manipulation. Manipulation is again a very, very important skill where you, um, when you are given a particular word, for example, you're given a particular word and you can change the beginning sounds and build new words or the middle sounds or the ending sounds. And uh, you manipulate the different, uh, uh, you know, the beginning, middle, or the end sounds, and you can try and make new words with it. So uh, again, all these skills uh, ultimately lead to better uh, reading skills or better word recognition skills. So to give you an example, if you say uh, blending, for example, when we say blending, for example, if you have the word b big, okay, so the b e g three different sounds, you're putting it together. So you pull the sounds together, b, e, g, and it becomes big. So that is blending, the act of pulling the sounds together to read the word. Segmenting usually is when you want to know what are the different sounds that are present in the word. And this particularly helps when it comes to spelling the words and writing the words out. So when you say the word big, you can slowly say the words, and break it up into its individual sounds. So when you say big, so let's say the sounds, and I usually use fingers with kids. So when we say big, b, a, g. So it's three sounds, b, a, and g, big. So then we can break it up. The first one is b, the second one is a, and the third one is g, and that makes big. So again, splitting it up, that is segmenting, helps to uh, understand, gain more understanding of, this, uh, of the sounds that are present in the word. So therefore it helps with spelling skills. And uh, you know, when you try to write it. Manipulation is when, for example, you give the same word big, and then you say, okay, take the B out and you know, uh, put another letter, say, uh, put the letter P there. So what will it become? So here you're changing the beginning sound the initial sound b and substituting it with another sound p and what does it become? It becomes pig. So again, you can do, this is an example of beginning sound manipulation. You can also uh, do middle sound manipulation where this big, the middle sound is the a sound, remove that vowel, put another vowel. Say you put an a or a u and ask the child to read the word. And uh, so the, instead of i, you put the A, it becomes B, A, G, back. So here you're manipulating the middle sounds. You can do the same thing for the ending sound. So instead of the G at the end, you can take that off and substitute with another um, a sound. Say, for example, you can use N. Mm. So, you know, uh, bin. So 
that uh, that becomes manipulation. So manipulating is basically trying to play around with the different kinds of sounds and making up new words. And manipulation is a very, very nice way of in enhancing phonological awareness, getting children to understand uh, what is uh, uh, what sounds are there at the beginning, middle, and end. How to how manipulating it changes the word and so on. So again, this enhances the overall phonological awareness in children. And manipulation is a very very active student engagement uh, kind of activity that can help enhance phonological awareness. Uh, manipulation can also uh, include adding on sounds. For example, if you've given the word, uh, you know, uh, ban, okay, b and ban, you can ask the child to insert another sound. After the b, put an r there. So add a sound and then read the word bran. So again, you can do addition, you can do substitution, you can do deletion, uh, you can do different ways of you know, manipulating the different kinds of sounds and letters in a word. And that uh, that becomes good word play as well as it increases the uh, phon phonemic knowledge in the children and which enables better word recognition. Then other uh, part is uh, sight word reading, which we also call as the, the, the whole word approach, where many of the common high frequency words, particularly in English, are not necessarily phonetically decodable. They cannot necessarily be sounded out. And many of these words, because they're so highly frequently used words in any printed matter or text matter, children need to recognize these instantly. So uh, what we call is look and say words. You just look and say it. And sometimes they are phonetically decodable, but many a time they are not. And therefore, in English, it is uh, sight word uh, reading has to be taught targetedly, and especially for children who have special needs issues or reading difficulties, this has to be very explicitly taught. And then when we come, uh, come to word attack skills, word attack skills is a combination of all this that I talked about. In addition, it helps us to, uh, there are certain other strategies also, which helps us to decode pronounce and read unfamiliar words. So not every word may be familiar to the child, but using these skills, using the blending skills or the side word skills or the segmenting skills, you know, you try and uh, pronounce even words which are not familiar to you. And that is the real test of reading. Uh, it's not just reading a word several times and practicing it several times. But, uh, you know, being able to decode any word put in front of you at that particular level, being able to use these kind of strategies and, you know, arrive at reading, uh, pronouncing the word. So, and usually we use a lot of word, different kinds of word attack skills when we are reading, usually long words, unfamiliar words. And here the syllables, uh, you know, breaking words into different syllables, chunking them, all these come up. We'll take a look at all these as we go on. So when we are looking at, uh, you know, the phonetic skills, we had talked about phonetic skills, especially the CVC words, that is the three letter words with a consonant, vowel, consonant, like B, a consonant, A, and T. So CVC words, where we started off with letter alphabet phonics and then move on to CVC words when we start with phonic reading. And then uh, after the uh, children achieve the CVC words, then you move on to, you know, bigger uh, words where we look into the other uh, aspects of reading, that is long vowels. So initially we were working with vowels, which are short vowel sounds. And now we move on to long vowel sounds, which usually we uh, use in CVVC words or CVCV words, that is consonant vowel, consonant words, or consonant vowel, consonant vowel words. An example for C, V, V, C would be like rain. R is a consonant, A and I, both vowels in the middle, and N, a consonant at the end. So these kind of words. A word uh, with C, V, C, V would be like make. You know, M as a consonant, A as a vowel, K as a consonant again, E as a vowel. So, you know, reading basically four letter words um, with different word uh, vowel combinations. And many of these come under the 
uh, long vowels uh, sound pattern. And even with long vowels, we have to teach them how to blend and segment these kind of words. Apart from long vowels, we also have to teach what is called as blends. Um, we also have to teach what is known as diagrams, diphthongs. So all these come under different phonetic, uh, phonic uh, uh, patterns. And we'll take a look at what these are. And while we teach uh, long vowels or blends or diagrams or diphthongs, just like we did with CVC words earlier on, use things like word families, word patterns, teach the different kinds of phonic rules. How do you say a particular word when a certain uh, you know, vowel pattern comes along and so on? So teaching of the phonic rules is also very important. And then in addition to that, we also teach grade level uh, appropriate uh, sight words. And uh, sight words are usually, if you look at the dole sight words or fry sight words, which are most commonly used, they are graded. They start from kindergarten and move on up to grade three to grade five levels. So there are graded uh, sight words, which you can targetedly teach. And then of course, uh, you know, the bigger words, the multisyllabic words, uh, which have to be taught, uh, especially a lot of these words come with subject content vocabulary. So, um, you know, how to decode those words. So when we are looking at long and short vowel sounds, vowel teams and patterns, we look at blends, we look at diagraphs, diphthongs, how are the different kinds of phonic rules, word attack skills, as well as sight words. When we looked at long vowels, after the short vowels, when we did CVC words, remember well, there was just one vowel. And when there's one vowel in the middle with two consonants on either side, like for example, the word bag, b -a -g. what happens is uh, usually the vowel in the center, which is only one vowel, it makes it sound. It doesn't say its name, it makes it sound. And that is the short vowel sound. When we come to long vowels, what happens is usually there are two vowels in the word. And the way we read it is the first vowel, if you look at the visual that is given here, the first vowel where it says V, there is a long line drawn at the top, which denotes that it says it's long sound. And the second vowel, there's a dotted uh, canceling of the vowel, which means it is silent. So what happens in most words, which are phonetically decodable, where there are two vowel combinations. What happens is the phonic rule is that the first vowel says the long sound and the long sound is nothing but the name of the letter. Okay, so saying the name of the letter and then uh, the, uh, if the word is A, the, if the first vowel is A, it just says A. It doesn't say its sound, it says its name. And the second vowel will be quiet. And if you can look at some of the examples that they've given. Um, I could give you one example, which says make, for example, the word make, M-A-K-E. The first vowel A is A, so it says its name. We don't say Mac, instead we say the name of the letter A. And the second vowel E, which is at the end, is quiet. So we read it as make. And when you write the word also, you can write it like that. You can highlight color code the vowel combination, and you can put those symbols at the, uh, you know, the long uh, vowel symbol of the first vowel and the dotted crossing out of the second vowel to enable them to read the word. So a lot of these words can be read this way. And there are different kinds of vowel teams that uh, come. We will go through different uh, combinations of these, which come as long vowels. So if you look at the vowel A, it has the short sound, which is A as an apple. I usually use the word apple, which is easily identifiable to most kids. So apple, cat, so that's the short sound, the A sound. When we say long A, it makes just the name of the letter. So A, so cake, bake, mate, and so on. Same with uh, the short, uh, the vowel e. The short sound, uh, the short sound is always the sound, e, eh, as an elephant or egg, whichever you use as a clue uh, a picture. And the long sound just says the name of the letter, that is e, as in feet or leaf and so on. And here again, when we say the long sound, if you look at the patterns, you will see there are two vowels. So the first one says its name, the second one is quiet. Same with, uh, goes with vowel I. Uh, when you say the I sound, 
that's the short sum. When you say I itself, then that's the long sum and different combinations where this happens. Same with vowel O. The vowel O is slightly difficult because the short and the long sound is very, very close together. So again, here you really have to work on the short and long sounds carefully with the kids. Even with a lot of teachers, I find if they're not first, uh, you know, if they're not very fluent in English, they find it difficult to get these sounds. So the short sound is A as in orange, you know, so A, clock, dog, and so on. Whereas the long sound is how you say the name of the letter O, so row, boat. So there's a very fine distinction, A and O. And it is very important that you work on these kind of sounds intensively with you. A vowel U, again, the short sound is A as in umbrella, so sun, jump, run, uh, bug, so on. And the long sound is just like say the name of the letter. So you, cute, uniform, unicorn, and so on. So this is the difference between the short and the long vowel sounds. And these have to be taught to children when you're giving reading interventions. Just a, a good visual, which helps us to understand how the short vowels and long vowels work. If you look at the ones in blue, the short vowel has that symbol, the, you know, the, a slightly uh, curved symbol over the small vowel, which denotes short vowel sound. And here it says the sound and you can, you know, you can give a visual anchor chart like this on your classroom walls, which says when it is short vowel, then you say the sound. Whereas when it is long vowels, you actually say the name of the letter. So, and uh, so this helps children to differentiate how to read these kind of words when there are uh, single vowels and double vowels. So different kinds of vowel teams and vowel patterns have to be taught. So for example, if you're teaching long A, there are different combination, vowel combinations, which make the long A or the A sound. So cake with the A, E combination, A, uh, E with a you know, consonant in between. Uh, so that is one uh, combination where you use the long A sound. A, I, as in weight, rain, May. So A, I comes again, the, the rule holds good here. The first vowel A says A, its name, and the second vowel I is quiet. So you teach it accordingly. A, Y. Now A, Y is a slightly dif uh, different because what happens is with A, Y also it makes a long A sound. Although it is spelt with a Y, but A, Y also gives a long A sound. So day, may, uh, tray and so on. So you have to, when basically the idea is when you teach uh, these long A sounds, you teach these kind of word families and what all comes under this. And having these kind of anchor charts actually help because if the child is say reading through a story or through a sentence and gets stuck at a word, they can look at these anchor charts if you put them up in the classroom and then you know, if the, uh, instead of giving the word, uh, word directly out, if the child gets stuck at the word, instead of giving the word directly out, what I normally do is I tell them to look at the anchor chart. Okay, this word has an A-Y in it, or this word has an E-Y in it, or A-I in it. So what sound does it make? It says long A. Long A says its name. So just say A. And, you know, clue them onto, and always... Instead of just giving the word out uh, to them, get them to go back to these anchor charts and practice those phonic rules. Because practicing these phonic rules helps them become more independent learners. If you just give the word away, uh, they still don't realize how you've got it. So get them back to refer to these kind of anchor charts. So having these kind of anchor charts in the classrooms help. If you look at the other one, the next one on the right-hand side, you see the long E, uh, combinations that are given, the different vowel combinations that make E sound. So uh, long E says E, just like the name of the letter. So you have a double E, which makes, you know, uh, like in feet or feel, uh, you have E uh, with the, uh, spelt with a Y at the end, like happy, city, every, and so on. Uh, you can also have E-Y, like, you know, donkey monkey, 
and so on. Those kind of words, EA combination, which makes again the long E sound. So uh, basically, again, like I talk, uh, told you about long A sounds, even in long E, there are different kinds of team, vowel teens or vowel patterns, which make the same sound. So teaching these kind of different combinations and at least start off with teaching the most common words in these patterns. And then when it comes to the uncommon words also, they will start referring to these, you know, they will start associating these vowel patterns or uh, teens with uh, those sounds. So basically understanding what vowel teens and what vowel patterns make what uh, kind of long vowel sound. Here again, the long O sound, the different combinations, uh, vowel patterns or vowel combinations that come for long O, like the O-E with a consonant, like a nose or cone, uh, bone, and so on. O-A coming together, as in toast, road. Um, O-W, again, W is not a vowel, but when O-W comes together, it could make a long O sound, such as in low, Bo, ro, and so on. O, e coming together uh, without a consonant. O, e coming just next to each other, as in to, um, and so on. So different kinds of vowel combinations. When you're teaching these long vowels, teach different kinds of uh, combinations and probably lots of words under each of the kind. So teaching word families really helps. And then long I, in long I also similarly, just as we saw with A, E and O, there are different kinds of patterns where just, uh, you know, uh, one I or I, E combination, I, G, H combination. Again, when I, G, H comes, the I is long and the G, H is silent. So, uh, or Y coming at the end or E coming at the end, for example. So, uh, these different kinds of combination words can be taught. Again, depending on what the level of the child is, which ones are you, uh, are you going to introduce. So as you go higher and higher up, you might use more and more complicated words. Initially, you would start with the more simpler words, the more commonly used words, and then move on to the uh, more difficult words. Similarly with you also, uh, you know, you have different you combination words where it says you and u. Sound. So, you know, different word combinations such as just U or U E combination, E W as in new, uh, true, and so on, where the U sound comes. Double O. And double O again, some people bring it under long vowels as long U, some people bring it under diff sounds. So, there can be a bit of an overlap. Uh, people do uh, some of the word vowel combinations. And certain schemes, they bring it under long vowels. Some schemes, they bring it under diagrams and diphthongs. It doesn't matter where it is uh, brought in, where it is labeled as, what it is labeled as. What is important is whether the child can read that uh, word or not. So it doesn't matter whether you bring it under long vowels or diphthongs or diagrams or whatever, because in certain books, you'll find there is an overlap. In some books, the double O, for example, is never listed under long vowels. It is brought under diphthongs. Uh, whereas in an EW also, you know, it, it is brought under diphthongs. Whereas in some, they bring that under uh, long vowels. So it doesn't matter what they bring it under, as long as the, uh, the bottom line is the children need to be able to see that word and be able to decode that. So again, these are different kinds of anchor charts, you know, similar things that you can have in your classroom where, you know, the long A, E, I, O, U and the different vowel combinations, you know, the different uh, combinations that make those sounds uh, can be portrayed. And again, as I said, these anchor charts are really very, very useful because uh, when a child is reading and gets stuck at the word, it is always you know, better to direct them to the anchor chart, get them to use the anchor chart uh, instead of just giving the word away. Because the more you get them used uh, to looking at anchor charts and, uh, or cluing them in on the funny clues. You know, if there are two vowels, I usually tell them, yeah, just clue them on, okay, there are two vowels, remember? So the first one, what, do, what happens when there are two vowels in a word? So get the child to say the funny rule. If the child can't say it, you repeat it. Get the child to repeat it. Okay, the first one says its name. The second one will be quiet. 
So go on. Or if it's a, you know, if it's a completely different combination like IGH, for example, you can say when there's IGH, look at the anchor chart. The I says I and GH is silent. So, you know, give the, these kind of um, hooks where the children can go back and refer and refresh their memory because that is very, very important. Um, never uh, usually just give the word away to the child. Always uh, clue them on in the into the phonic rule that they should apply or the verbal pattern or the, uh, the vowel team that, uh, that is forming the word. And if, if it is that particular vowel team or vowel pattern, how do you sound it out? What is the sound that you use? So clue them in on these kind of uh, different kinds of things. And th these are just different examples of, um, you know, anchor charts that can be used in your classroom. And then we come to blends. Blends are usually when there are two letters, two consonants usually, when these are put together and you can hear both the sound. So for example, uh, in this picture, they've shown you S, which makes sound, L, L sound, and you put it together, it becomes L. So slant, for example. Similarly, frog, fr, r, that's a blend, fr. So blends consist of two letters uh, and each letter sound can be heard. And there are groups of consonants, which, uh, you know, there are certain uh, blends which are very common. Uh, and some of these blends uh, come at the beginning of a word and some of the blends come at the end of the word. So when you're uh, teaching children, when you teach CVC words, and again, it depends on the children and the level of children, the age of the children. Uh, if you're teaching very, very young kids, you can wait for blends until later. But if you're uh, teaching children, say, from grade two or grade three level, you know, while you teach the CVC words, for example, you're teaching the at family words. Uh, at the end of at, I usually add a blend, you know, like a flat. So because uh, they're kind of mature enough to get it and uh, they know all the letter sounds. So, you know, you don't have to wait until much later to introduce the blends. Along with the CVC words itself, you can introduce the blends. But if they're very young kids, then I would wait for blends uh, to introduce blends until later on. Again, everything has to be customized as per the level of the child and age of the child. So some of the beginning blends are what you see on these anchor charts, uh, you know, blur, clur, flur, glur, uh, blur, slur, br, cr, dr, fr. So many of these, you know, and uh, some of the clue uh, pictures are also given. So these are beginning uh, blends coming at the beginning of the word. There are ending blends also, ld, like held, ulf, as in shelf, mp, as in lamp, hand, ld, sound at the end, bank, nk, at the end, nt, as in tent, sk, as in desk, st, as in nest or best and so on. So blends can come at the beginning or at the end of a word. And usually most kids, uh, if they once they get the uh, alphabet phonics right, uh, the blends are usually not very difficult, um, especially start off again, start off with common words that they know and then move on to, uh, you know, more difficult words. So um, unless they have pronunciation issues, Sometimes when children have pronunciation or misarticulation issues, they have difficulty in pronouncing the two uh, sounds together. And there they may need a lot of, uh, you know, articulation training on how these sounds are formed. And again, here you might need the help of a speech therapist on the, uh, you know, how to uh, put these sounds to So fr, for example, it be and r, and how to bring it together quickly. So uh, you might need to, uh, consult a speech therapist if children are having difficulty with these kind of sounds. But usually most kids, once they get the alphabet phonics, you find the blends are not all that difficult with a, a great number of kids. And then there is diagrams. Again, with diagrams, just as I talked about the blends, what I do is I look at the level of the child if they're slightly older children and I'm teaching them say CVC words or the long vowel words. I try to bring in the diagrams there itself if I know the child can handle it. So as I said, you know, while teaching the at words, I've taught the cat, bat, uh, mat, whatever. And at the end, I added a blend flat. 
I can also add a diagraph like that. The diagraph means, diagraph is usually the TH, SH, WH, and CH words. Two consonants coming together, but they make a completely new sound and it makes one sound. So it is a combination. So there's S and H, which makes the S and the H sound. But when they come together, uh, they make a completely new sound, which is SH. So again, teaching these uh, diagraph combinations, SH words, CH words, WH words, F, um, the PH words, and so on. So um, um, usually they are made up of uh, two uh, consonants. And here again, as I said, depending upon the ch uh, child's level, you can also add uh, one blend or one diagraph to the word families that you uh, teach if the child can handle it. Uh, yeah, because uh, as I said, sometimes children come to us uh, uh, to us at grade two or grade three level, you know, and uh, they kind of know the alphabet phonics. Uh, developmentally, they're kind of mature. So uh, while I teach the phonetic blending and segmenting skills, and you know, along with that, I introduce the blends and diagrams along with each word families itself, so that I don't have to wait until later on. But if you're looking at very young kids you know, um, say they're in the kindergarten or grade one, then I would uh, probably wait until later to introduce the diagraphs and uh, blends. And uh, usually after the CVC words, uh, before I go into the long vowels, I introduce some of the diagraphs, at least the TH and so on. Because some of these come as sight words also as, you know, that, this, these are very commonly used sight words as well. So you can introduce diagraphs there too. <clears throat> so again, diagraphs can appear at the beginning of a word, as, as in uh, shoe, the sh is uh, coming at the beginning of a word, chair, ch is coming at the beginning of a word, uh, photo, ph, the first sound is coming at the beginning of a word. You can also have ending diagraphs, such as, you know, sandwich, the ch is coming at the end of the word, fish is coming at the end of the word. So similarly, uh, there can be beginning diagrams, ending diagrams. And again, teaching all these targetedly is what matters. And then diphthongs. Diphthongs are normally uh, uh, sound combinations that don't fit into either the long vowels or the diagrams and the blends. So they, have, they are completely different sets of vowel or a vowel consonant combinations, which make completely new sounds. And usually these are uh, categorized under diphthongs. But again, as I said, don't get confused. If you look at different books, um, you know, sometimes there are a lot of overlaps between diphthongs and diagrams and uh, long vowels. In, in some books, even the double O is brought under diphthongs, whereas in some books, they say double O comes under the long U, long vowel U category. So don't worry about where it comes under. Basically, what, uh, um, what we have to do is you have to teach these kind of combinations and how to read them to the children. So again, in diphthongs, you know, there are different kinds of sounds that come in. The E, R, I, R, U, R, spelled differently, but they all make the er uh sound, as in bird, serve, fur, and so on, worms. You know, so different combinations. So again, teaching these kind of word families, different word combinations, that is what is important. And uh, uh, when we teach these kind of word families, uh, you know, again, uh, teach the most commonly used ones so that children can relate to this. And uh, uh, give the more common words first, and then you can add on the much more difficult. So uh, teaching the phonic rules is very important. One of the phonic rules I already mentioned, like when two vowels come together, there's a popular saying, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking and it says its name. So when there are two vowels, say A and I, the first one does, says its name, the second one does not talk. That means it is silent. So this is how you read the word. So again, you know, giving these kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 interesting anecdotes where, you know, the first vowel does the talking, the other one does it, so it's quiet. Uh, these kind of things helps children to remember these phonic rules and rehearse these phon uh, phonic rules. R control vowels, if there are R's coming in, well, okay, these are the posse R's. 
you know, and you can have, when the R comes, uh, remember you have to, this is how you pronounce it. So any vowel which uh, is followed by an R, the vowel sounds slightly changes. So uh, when you look at the vowel A, for example, you know, it's either says A ah, if it's a short vowel sound, or it says A if it's a long vowel sound. But when the R comes after the, uh, this thing, it makes a completely slightly different sound, which is R, like in star or car and so on. Or same with O, R. So again, you know, the sound changes. The R kind of modifies the vowel sound a bit. So again, teaching them how these kind of, uh, when the R comes, how do you pronounce it? This is important. Um, when it comes to uh, C and uh, G, Initially, you start off with the cur sound, which is the, uh, and then you go on to the sir sound, uh, like in C as in circle and so on. And similarly with G, you start off with the uh, gur sound initially, but then as the children, uh, you know, when you, as they move into higher words, you can use G as a j, like in giraffe, or ginger, uh, germs, and so on. So again, we start off with the ker and the ger sound initially when we do alphabet phonics, but as we proceed on, then we can uh, introduce slowly. Once they get comfortable with the so uh, initial sounds, then you can move on to the higher level sounds. Words that end in Y. Uh, usually when words end in Y, it either says I or it says E. So which is more like a long E sound or a long I sound. So again, use different kinds of words that uh, end in Y. So if it is Y making the long I sound, you can have fly, dry, cry, and so on. And if they end in the long E sound, you can have words like happy, army, um, any, and so on. So, you know, uh, give different kinds of word uh, that follow these kind of patterns when you're enforcing these kind of phonics. And again, when it comes to diphthongs, you know how different combinations are uh, sounded out. Again, teach them as word families because this really helps them to bring out and use the more common words. So if it is O W or O U, you know cow, bound, uh, these kind of uh, sounds uh, go. O W uh, in the other um, O W can say ow. O W can also say O as in long O. So again, give different kinds of actions that will, um, uh, you know, uh, that will kind of different, help them differentiate. So ow, o w as ow can be done with a little pinch, you know, ouch, like that's the sound it makes. Or o w can be like an o, like you blow, you know. So again, associate it with different kinds of actions, which helps understand uh, how to make those sounds. So. Um, Use the different kinds of diphthongs and, you know, uh, use it with commonly used words, which again helps with um, sounding, you know, using the phonic rules to sound the word out. Uh, using the different kinds of endings of words, like the ED endings or the ES endings, ING endings. So again, uh, help the children to, uh, you know, separate the root word from the word endings and then sound out the word. And again, this is very useful when you read the longer words or the multi-syllabic words. When we come to word attack strategies, you know, to help and understand unfamiliar words or, you know, uh, uh, you know, if there are longer words, unfamiliar words, how to go about sounding these words out. And generally what we do is we sound the word out, but we also look for, you know, uh, breakable chunks in the word, break it up into certain parts and or connecting it to a known word and then trying to put it all together. So lots of different strategies that are used as word attack skills, especially when we are um, trying to read multisyllabic or longer words. So what do we do when we uh, have longer words? You know, some of these, these this again uh, is an anchor chart which helps us to uh, remind the students what are some of the strategies we can use. So look for the beginning parts of a word. If there are word prefixes, you know, like un or re or x, you know, so you can uh, um, you can separate the prefix out and then read the rest of the word. So if the word is 
rewrite. You know, the re can be broken up. Read the word write, the side word, and then put it together, rewrite. So root, uh, separate the beginning part from the root word. So you can look for the beginning parts of the word if there is any uh, which can be separated and then you can read the beginning part separately, the other parts separately and put it together. You can also look for ending parts of words, like if there are words ending in ing or ly or l-e-s-s, -S, uh, n-e-s-s, -S, like happiness, for example, or joyful, you know, um, having. So separate the ending part break up this uh, ending part, read the other, the first part of it, and then put the ending part, read it separately, and then put it together. So looking for familiar parts, whether it is at the beginning of a word or ending of a word, this is one strategy uh, to help uh, attack longer words. Look for vowel patterns, which we've already talked about. You know, look for either the short or long vowel patterns or the uh, diphthongs or whatever. You can also word, break up word into syllables. Uh, uh, breaking up into syllables is usually, you can say the word and get them to clap rhythmically. So if you say kitten, kitten, so break it up. So kit and ten. So break the word up as kit and then ten and then sound the kit out and then the ten out and then put them together. Or if there are two word combinations, if there are, it's a compound word. For example, if the word is sandbox, so sand is the first part of the word, box is the next. So break it up. You get the children to break it up and say the first part of the word, and then the next part of the word, and then put it together. So, uh, and then get them to, you know, after doing these strategies, uh, you know, read the word out and then ask them to check, does it sound right? Does it make sense in that particular sentence if I say the word? If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't sound right, then go back and reread it again. So use these strategies and read it again. So this is how we help children to read longer words. So even within a word, you know, look for all these kind of prefixes, suffixes, which is the beginning, ending part of the word, word patterns that you uh, you have already taught and the children may be familiar with. So all these kind of things can be looked into and word, um, you know, word attack strategies uh, have to be, again, these have to be taught and practiced with children so that they know that when a word is presented to them, this is how they go about decoding these words. And again, as I said, don't just give the word away, get them to practice these and rehearse these strategies so they become more and more independent readers. And then, so this is all we've talked about how to go about doing these things in uh, phonics skills. Now to come with uh, sight words. Sight word skills, again, whole word approach, highly frequently used words. Most commonly used words are Dolch's list and the Fry's list. There are, uh, if you go about the net, you'll get a whole host of these, uh, you know, uh, sight word list categories that are available uh, as per grade level. So, uh, you know, you can teach those words targetedly. Uh, and uh, if they are um, categorized according to grade level, go according to that. If you have uh, a certain reading scheme that you follow, you can also follow the uh, sight words that are targeted through the reading skills. Now, when it comes to spelling skills, once you we've talked about how to blend, how to use word attack skills uh, so that they can decode and read words. When it comes to uh, spelling, uh, uh, one of the most popularly used method is, you know, just memorize the spellings. Uh, but some of the, um, you know, uh, ways of doing spellings differently is use your blending, segmenting, and mapping strategies. Mapping is when you segment the word and then you write it down, you know, send uh, letter by letter for the blanks given. So if the word is bag and you're saying ag, Give the three blanks so that the child can write one letter on each. Or if it's a long vowel word, for example, you're giving a word such as um, uh, bake. You know, give the four blanks for the, uh, to stand for the four letters and then say bake. So that they get the idea, they can visualize that there are four letters in the word. So that is called mapping, where you actually provide a, a blank 
for uh, each of the letter that is uh, present in the word. And sometimes you can also give clues. For example, if you're giving the word fish, the S and H together make one sound. So you can give the four blanks, one for the F, the I. For SH, because it's one sound, you can give the two blanks and then put a circle around the two together. So that when you're, uh, yeah, when you're teaching them the spelling, say that there are two letters, but it's one sound. It is together. Okay, so the same with blends also. You know, you can kind of give the two blanks for the blends, but tell that, you know, they are together, they're sounded together. So these kind of uh, strategies uh, can be employed when you're teaching spelling skills. Use syllable patterns to recognize similar words. For example, we talked about, you know, uh, the word families and so on. Awareness of prefixes and suffixes. All the uh, skills that I talked about while reading, you know, for the word attack skills, same things can be used for writing uh, the words down, so which will help in spelling. So these uh, skills are not just for reading, but they are also helping in spelling skills. And then, of course, you can also try the most commonly used method. Look at the word, read the word, cover the word up, and try to recall or recollect the word and write it. And to help in recollection, this is why I said give the mapping strategy where you give the blanks uh, for each of the letter that, that is there present in the word. Um, use interactive word walls or dictionaries or spelling lists that prepared ahead of time. So if you look at the picture, you see some of those, especially the high frequency words, which are not necessarily phonetically decodable. Now, I usually have a little dictionaries like this with the sight words. So even if they are, you know, uh, especially if they are asked to write a word or write a sentence, for example, if they do not know how to spell or they are kind of unsure about the spelling. You know, if you have word walls or dictionaries like these, ask them to refer to that and then write, rather than you giving the, as a teacher, giving the spelling away. They can use all the blending if they are phonetically decodable words, use the blending, segmenting, and mapping strategies, or use the prefix, suffix, vowel patterns, and all that. Or if they are not phonetically decodable words, use the word walls or dictionaries uh, to you know, find the spellings, especially when they're doing expressive writing. Because a lot of our children, when they're doing written work, they, they get halted because they do not know how to spell or they're unsure of spelling the word, or they're scared of making spelling errors. So they tend to just ask, you know, what is the spelling? So instead of just giving it again to them, if it is a phonetically decodable word, remind them of, uh, tell them, okay, you can sound it out. Or you can give the blanks on the book and say this many letters are there, say it slowly and map it onto the blanks. But if they are not phonetically decodable words, it's wiser to use things like word walls or dictionaries like this, where they can go back, refer. And referring also helps because every time they refer, they're being exposed to that word more and more. And they learn where to go for and find words. And you have to remember that some of these children, even if we teach all these skills, some of them, depending upon the severity of their challenges, they may uh, not become very good spellers even. They may learn certain amount of spellings, but some of them may rem remain weak spellers all their life. So at least, you know, they need to have a skill that, you know, they have to go back and do a spell check. So using a dictionary, using a word wall helps because later on also they can go, even when they grow up, they can go, they know, they'll be aware, you know, their spellings are weak and therefore they have to go back and, uh, you know, do a spell check or use a dictionary, whether it's online, offline, whatever. So all, for all this, you're laying down the foundations of a very good study skill also to make them understand that, you know, this is one way of um, finding out spellings. What we should not do, you try to avoid doing when we are uh, teaching spelling skills. Like some of them, I've seen a lot of teachers, they do have word walls, but uh, they, they put up all the words right at the beginning of the uh, uh, year itself. Beginning of the academic year, the world word is all put up and then it just remains there, it remains stagnant. So therefore that loses, uh, students stop noticing it. But uh, what I would suggest is when I used to start off, I would have just the ABCs on the word wall when I start off the academic year. 
And as I'm targetedly, you know, every week, as I'm targetedly introducing certain words, that is when those words go up on the word wall. So uh, what happens is the word wall is not stagnant. It starts off blank with just the alphabets. And then when the words are introduced every week, then the words go up on the word wall. So the children see that it is constantly changing. You're keeping on adding new words. So when that happens and the children uh, find that this, you know, more and more new words are added on, then they know that they can keep looking at the words. Do you put up a word wall right at the beginning of the year? Uh, it loses its novelty value. So, you know, try, don't keep the word wall stagnant. Keep adding new words as you introduce uh, new words. And don't just rely heavily on just memorizing the spellings. As I said, you know, use all the phon uh, phonetic skills, the phonetic uh, rules, the mapping skills, the blending skills, the segmenting skills, uh, the prefix, suffix uh, rules, all these, the word attack skills, use them while you're teaching the spelling uh, skills. For each word, you know, tell these children how it can be broken up and how it can be sounded out or uh, how it can be, or even through shapes of words, especially if they're sight words, sometimes it's the shape of the word, uh, which helps. So how these different strategies have to be taught with regard to uh, when you're teaching spelling words. And try to use words which are part of active vocabulary. When we say active vocabulary, words that they're going, likely to use all the time, especially in the early stages. You know, in the young classes, rather than give them very heavy um, uh, vocabulary, which they probably, they may not even use all their life, uh, or they may be just using for one particular lesson, and after that, that word is hardly ever used. Use words which are, which will be more actively used, like the high frequency words, like the phonetic words. So, because it is necessary to know how to spell those words far more than very unusual words. So, concentrate on the more commonly used words. So that will become part of active vocabulary. Otherwise, those vocabulary uh, becomes very passive, which means that they learn it for that week's spellings, but once the spelling test is over, they've forgotten that. So rather than that, choose these kind of words, which are more uh, utility oriented when it comes to reading and writing. So what are the challenges uh, faced by children when it comes to uh, you know, children with special needs. Some of the challenges they have are, you know, remembering the letter sounds, recognizing the different sound patterns, being able to blend and segment, remembering the phonetically decodable words, the phonic patterns, the phonic rules, uh, reading fluently at a certain even speed, understanding or comprehending while they are reading and spelling even the highly frequently used words, spelling those words correctly. So some of these are challenges that our children have. And what can we do to improve this? Again, it goes without saying a universal design, which is, you know, use multi-sensory, multi-modality learning activities. Most of our children and especially children with special needs learn better when there are multiple ways of presenting the um, uh, matter, uh, the learning matter given to them. So that uh, helps them to access the learning material better. So use a lot of multi-sensory, multi-modality activities. Include worksheets which are, you know, tailor-made for the child or customized as per the child's needs and uh, challenges. Provide repetition, but provide repetition in different, different ways. Don't repeat in the same manner. So if you're, uh, say, uh, asking the child to practice uh, spelling the word by writing 10 times, just writing 10 times alone is not enough. So probably building the words using letter cards or then writing the words on fan or then uh, write, mapping the words with the blanks given. So give it in different ways. So repeating is important, but not repeating in the same boring, monotonous ways, but repeating in different, different ways. And then... Our children tend to forget things over time. So you have to rehearse old concepts periodically. So this is again, so for example, if I've taught the short vowel A, and then I've taught uh, the long, uh, I've moved to E, um, or uh, after A, I've moved to O, for example. And then after O, uh, you know, rehearse the A and the O as well, you know. 
and so don't leave the things that you have uh, uh, already done previously. Because what happens is in regular schools in particular, we tend to move on without doing constant rehearsing or re uh, revision of the older concepts. So with our kids, definitely uh, constant periodical uh, rehearsing is very, very important. So you have to go, go back to the uh, uh, things and you can create worksheets that are tailor-made for these kind of things. So even if you move to long vowel sounds, for example, you can still give you know, a comparison between long and short vowel. So you're rehearsing the short vowel, but you have also, you're also uh, you know, giving uh, uh, the short vowel sounds. So again, re uh, rehearsing these periodically. So activities to improve vowel sounds. What are some of the activities that we can use? Some of the sample activities are you can give word sorting activities. Again, this is a hands-on activity. So, you know, again, as I said, when you have introduced long vowel sounds, they may get confused. There is a little bit of confusion that happens because all these times you've been saying sh the short vowel sounds and suddenly now the vowels start saying its name. So you need to give words, uh, you know, that belong to both categories and then ask them to read it, decode the word and then sort it, uh, whether it's a short sound or the long sound. And again, remind them of the rules. When it is one vowel, it is a short sound. It is the sound that says, when it is a, a two vowels, then the first one says its name, which is a long sound. And the second one is quiet. So again, keep rehearsing the phonic rules, do these different kinds of activities. You can also give word, uh, you know, like finding the vowel team where the child has to highlight the, the, the certain vowel team that is making that particular long a, a long O sound. So for example, in this worksheet, you, they're focused on the long O sound as an OA combination. You can, now this is just for OA. You can even give mixed, you know, initially you can give OA, but then if the child has learned, you know, if you've already introduced the different kinds of uh, long O combinations, you can give all the different combinations in, in one worksheet and ask them to color the different, uh, the highlight, the different vowel uh, patterns that make the long O. So it can be OA combination, OE combination, OW combination and so on. So you can give, put in words which are of mixed uh, vowel patterns, but all making the long O. So initially you can start off with just one vowel pattern. And as you go along, you can increase the different kinds of vowel pattern even within that one particular worksheet. And then cutting it up. So cutting up, uh, if you look at the left-hand side, now these are short ones, but even with the long vowel uh, words, you can actually cut them up like this. You can pull them apart. This actually helps in uh, blending and segmenting. When physically they're able to blend and segment. You can uh, do that. So when you, uh, the picture actually gives them a clue on how to read the word, they can also phonetically decode it. You can also do this with uh, alphabet cards or you know, foam or plastic alphabet letters. So uh, putting them together and pulling them apart when you're physically doing it with those uh, alphabets, cutouts or alphabet letters, that actually aids in better understanding of what is happening when you're blending and when you're uh, segmenting. Long vowel sound activity uh, sheets. You can have words where just the long vowel pattern has to be given, like in the uh, left-hand side. The one in the center, for example, uh, here they have to do very fine discrimination. They have to actually read both the words, uh, both the sound combinations given and see which one matches with the picture, which is the correct word and how it needs to be read. Same with the, uh, the one on the right-hand side, we have both the short and the long vowel sounds all given mixed up. They have to read each one and then write it. And here again, you know, you can add on to this worksheet by asking them to sort it out. You can give a list saying short O words and short um, long O words and ask them to sort it and write it under the two different groups. So here what is happening is you're not only doing long vowel, but you're differentiating it from the short vowel. So they are getting uh, the, the confusion that can arise between the long and short vowel, you know, through rigorous training like this, uh, they can see how they are different and uh, learn to uh, differentiate these more and more as, uh, you know, give, you give more and more practice. So all this uh, can be done through these kind of, uh, you know, different kinds of worksheets like this. 
And besides, as I said, this helps to rehearse the old uh, short vowel sounds also, because as I said, you need to rehearse these things periodically. So again, helping them understand, compare and contrast these two kinds of uh, long and short vowel sounds. So here again, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the middle worksheet, for example, uh, they've given cake and cap. Very similar looking words, but just the two vowel and one vowel uh, is different. T tap and tape. So they have to read it both accordingly using the correct phonetic rule. So, uh, and then see which one matches with the picture. Sometimes it's a short vowel word which matches with the picture. Sometimes it's the long vowel word. And uh, so again, diff helping, uh, you know, using worksheets where they can differentiate between the uh, short and uh, long vowel actually helps strengthen their phonetic blending and uh, segmenting skills. And uh, using word families. For example, here it's all long O, but then you've broken them up in the word, uh, word families, the right hand side, the O-T-E words, the O-L-E words, O-M-E words, and so on. So again, categorizing them according to uh, word families. And if you want, you can even throw in a lot, some of the short vowel words also along with this. So you can have, uh, instead of just O-T-E, you can have the O-T-E as well as the O-T words. So again, you know, basically giving them a lot of practice in um, differentiating and understanding how long and short vowels are different and how they need to be read differently using different kinds of phonic rules. So again, each time they do that, remind them of the rules. You know, for example, when they're reading cape and cap, you know, cape. Just remind them there are two vowels. So remember when two vowels are there, the first one does the talking, the second one is quiet. So and when it does the talking, it says its name. And uh, when it when you read uh, the cap word, for example, just one vowel, so it says its sound. All the letters say its sound. So cap. So again, reminding them of when they're decoding, keep reminding them of the phonic rules, uh, reminding them of the vowel patterns and why when the certain vowel pattern scheme, what are the uh, ways you pronounce? Here again, word building using word flashcards. You can also use plastic or foam letters, uh, you know, to, to put words together, to break them apart. Again, these help in blending and segmenting activities. And uh, with a lot of our kids, many of them have audit, uh, most of them find it difficult uh, to blend because when they say the sounds auditorily, uh, they can say the individual sounds, but auditorily they are not able to put it together, or they are not able to pull it apart together. So having the visual component, uh, where they are actually seeing the letters, the flash, the letter flashcards, or the vowel combination flashcards help. And if they are uh, actually manipulating it, you know, using their hands and fingers, again, kinesthetic learning. So what happens is what uh, deficit they have by way of auditory. Uh, you know, processing which interferes with their blending and segmenting can be compensated by using the visual blending and segmenting or the uh, kinesthetic blending and segmenting. If you look at the worksheet in the between the middle one here again, the words, for example, sob, it's together, then they are, we pull it apart. Each letter sound is, uh, you know, given into one box each so that they can segment it. And again, they can put it together and blend it. So this again gives an idea about how you can um, put sounds together and pull them apart. All these help in better reading as well as better spelling skills. And then uh, reading and drawing activities. Drawing is something I use extensively with uh, most of my children because it, um, with most of our children, especially if they have learning difficulties, they are pretty stressed out when they're learning, you know, you know when they're reading. So uh, once they read the word, get them to draw or get them to color if there is a picture there. That kind of breaks that stress out. It kind of de-stresses them. So, you know, getting them, to, and it also helps in comprehension. So draw, getting them to draw, um, uh, and it doesn't have to be very elaborate drawings, even simple, uh, you know, through use, use of simple shapes, they can get to draw a picture or even stick figures, something very simple, just to illustrate what each one is, you know, helps. So use a lot of drawing also, and or if the pictures are already there on the worksheet, you can get them to color as well. So that kind of de-stresses them. It also pro provides a good relief in between the 
uh, reading writing activities. Activities which can improve uh, blending and segmenting, some I've already shown you. Again, using a flip chart, the, uh, you know, the left hand side, you see different flip charts. So again, flip charts are very, very useful when you can use different, different combinations of vowel patterns, whether it's short vowels, long vowel blends, digraphs, whether you want to change. And, you know, for phonemic manipulation, this really helps. So, uh, you know, you can change the mid, uh, beginning sounds, middle sounds, ending sounds, and so on. So uh, flip charts are a great way of, you know, uh, um, enhancing um, phonological awareness. And if you have a flip chart, it's uh, it's quick. You know, you don't need any heavy materials for that. Even if you have 10, 15 minutes at the end of a lesson when you can't go on to something big, you can quickly take up your flip chart and just rehearse the, the uh, you know, the words that you have been practicing or the words you have been targeting with the children or the phonic patterns you've been working on. You can even have, you know, hands-on activities like, you know, using different sounds and their words. Um, these are pictures with sure sound, uh, which begin with the sure sound. And uh, at the back of the uh, picture, you have the word written. So, for example, if you look at the picture, the first picture of the, at the tail of the S, there's a picture of the sheep. At the reverse side, the word sheep is written. So, you know, you can, they can read it and then put it and it all forms the, uh, the diagraph that it is on. And you can do this with blends, diagraphs, anything at all. You can use different pictures and make up a jigsaw puzzle. Like this. The one at the right hand side, that actually helps in a lot of blending activities. Uh, some of the children do have difficulties putting sounds together. So one of the ways you can do it is write it in different ways and use a little toy card. You know, for example, to read the word shut, for example. The car starts from the sh. So you're as you're moving, you're not breaking the sounds. You're kind of pulling your sounds and then coming to the end. So again, that helps in blending. Uh, I also do that with the alphabet, uh, you know, the plastic alphabet. Sometimes I put each one apart. For example, the sh, a, and t is put apart. And they say sh, a, t. And then you bring it a little bit closer and they have to say sh, a, t, and then bring it further closer, sh, a, t, and then put it further closer. So visually they can see that you have to bring the sounds together. And kinesthetically also this helps. With some children, even if you don't have a toy car or something, uh, you know, you can even do it on their hands. Sometimes I just ask them to hold up their hands and do, you know, b, a, t, bat, or, you know, the other way around, b, at, b, at, or sh, at, sh, at, sh, at. So, you know, doing it faster uh, helps them in um, doing, uh, making it, uh, you know, blending the sound. Similar things can be used for um, uh, segmenting also. So for example, using the same word, shut. You know, if you say shut, say shut, and then say, sh, say it slowly, sh, shut. So what comes here? Sh, a, t. So again, to pull the sounds. You can also use fingers. Fingers is something I always use with my uh, kids. You know, so two letters, sh, a, t. So sh, a, t, sh, a, t. So say shut and then break them into uh, sounds. So again, these kind of activities help with blending and segmenting. Uh, here, uh, again, another worksheet which helps with this, Some, uh, you know, where uh, they have to, uh, the left hand side, it talks about a blend worksheet, where they have to actually color the blend. So it depends upon when uh, you roll a dice and when you get a certain number, it's a game, basically. So using game boards like this, where they have to, uh, when they get a particular uh, dice, say, for example, it's three. So look at three, find any word uh, there, circle the word and say, read the word. So basically, um, trying to find out which word it is. So using, you know, just to engage the student more actively in these kind of activities. Here again, on the right hand side, you find where, you know, the worksheet is actually helping you to map the word and to segment the word. Mapping is, this is what I meant by mapping, where you give the different blanks. Uh, 
and where it uh, where the blend is you kind of give those breaks in between you know with the hyphens in between so when it says flip so flip e flip is a blend with two blanks and the e in the middle and then the p at the end so same way all the other blends also you can you can use the digraphs and all these more difficult words you know you can actually give mapping as an activity even during spelling tests for example um, when i was teaching uh, you know the younger grades grade 1 grade 2 grade even in grade 3 i would use mapping and for all kids not just for children with um, you know if they want to use it they can use it if they know it off without the mapping strategy that's fine but it was given to all the kids on the board i would actually put up the mapping the blanks and if they are blends or their diagrams i would even you know circle that part so if it's a flur uh, you know the flur part would be circled showing there are two blanks there but they are kind of they say the sum together so when you say the word also and even when you give spelling test you know it says suppose you're giving the word stop say stop and then say st a p and then point to those mapping blanks as you say it when you're segmenting so that and then say it together again stop and uh, get the children to write and initially you know uh, i i think it is very important that children learn these kind of skills because this is what contributes to better spelling skills later on you can also use little songs especially for the ones who like to learn through you know listening um you know you can use songs which uh, give a lot of rhymes so here you find there are certain Uh, for example the and words they've given a lot of uh, uh, rhyming words the tall man there was a man a tall tall man who ran and ran into a can so a lot of and words are coming he fell right in his feet stuck out he made a plan to scream and shout so again here uh, even though it's focusing on and there are two other words which are also rhyming like out and shout so you can get them to figure out the and words and then you can ask them okay is there anything else which are bringing out so again getting them to go back listen and find out other words which are also rhyme so teaching them these kind of phonetic patterns uh, helps in better reading and um, writing skills uh, and spelling skills so rhymes are a great way of uh, teaching uh, these skills so when it comes to um, sight words again sight words as i said many of them are not phonetically decodable and it's very difficult to try and illustrate and show some of them so basically it is how it is utilized or used in a particular sentence that is important so reading it building it with uh, alphabet you know cutouts or uh, this thing you can use play doh even you can use sand writing um using them in fill in the blank kind of activities again fill in the blanks instead of just providing a worksheet you can do a hands on activity like you find in the um left hand corner here you know the words are there the child can actually read the sentence and try out the different uh words that are given the sight words which are given at the bottom and try those words out and see if if, if it makes sense in the sentence if it doesn't they can put it down and try the next word so this gives them an idea that how to go about doing um, a fill in the blank activity that they have to try the different words put it in the sentence read the sentence see if it makes sense if it doesn't make sense then put it back and try out another word so the whole cognitive processing that goes about um, you know uh, in the, in a simple activity such as fill in the blanks many of our children have trouble with that that kind of cognitive processing so doing an activity like this actually helps uh, before you even get on to a worksheet or even while you do a worksheet if you do this as a hands on activity and then move on to the worksheet it helps them better because then they know that they have to try these different words you can also do these as on the board activities where you can have the different flash cards so again as i said give multi uh, sensory uh, things where they can you know uh, find words uh, give different uh, where they have to match words do um, you know uh, sand and uh, salt tracing again giving a lot of kinesthetic tactile uh, things 
using hopscotch. Um, again, in some of the schools I worked, we wouldn't write the words in the hopscotch. The hopscotch template would be painted on the playground. But what we would do is we each class, when if we are planning to have an activity outside, we would go with the word flashcards. So the template was there and we would just put the flashcards. So uh, once our lesson was over, we could just gather the flashcards back and come away and another class can come there and use the same um, you know hopscotch template and with their flashcards so you don't even have to use a chalk to write it down you can draw the basic temp template and then use flashcards where they either had to jump you can have it as a game use a whistle jump or you know say a word or you hold up a word and they have to read it and find and jump to the exact word and so on again all these um, employ active student uh, engagement um, uh, 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 and these help it better, uh, you know, uh, learning. So uh, different kinds of practice worksheets where uh, not only are the sight words uh, just uh, taught as flashcards, but the writing part of it, the usage part of it in sentences, uh, as fill in the blanks, as repetitive sentences, where the same, for example, if you're teaching the word, um, I see a big. You know, so I see a big is repeated in diff with different words in different sentences. So repetition is provided, but in a, uh, the, uh, you know, the same word is repeated, but with uh, different sentences. So learning that these words can be used in different kinds of sentences. Use them in little stories. So don't just use the words in isolation. Use it in context, in sentences, in stories where they have to read the story and then circle the word. For example, on the left-hand side, you find the word the, and they have to uh, read the story. And wherever they find the word the, they have to go around circling. You can also give word flashcards where children have to jumble words, you know, where they have to uh, put the sight words in order and make a uh, uh, construct a proper sentence. Sentence construction also helps in better reading. So because it helps in the co uh, comprehension part of it, it helps in um, you know decoding part of it. It also helps you to bring the grammar element and all that. It has a precursor. You're not introducing grammar per se right now, but it helps. Word searches. <coughs> Putting words in alphabetical order, jigsaw, uh, you know, crossword kind of activities, uh, visualizing words where the words uh, are uh, picturized in a way that gives out the meaning of the word. For example, in the middle, you find where it says down, the word is sliding down. Uh, where it says help, you know, somebody is crying for help from the drowning water. Or you can have flashcard words with uh, sample sentences on it, which gives the meaning, uh, illustrates the meaning of the flashcards. You can also have flashcards with embossed uh, sandpaper or, you know, cork mats where the child can feel and write it. Uh, again, that helps for tactile and kinesthetic. So coming to um, a case scenario, Tina is in first grade. She knows her letter sounds well, but she has difficulties in blending. So how can we support her? I would like the participants to uh, give ideas about how we can help her in blending sounds to read the word. Participants, you can drop in your answers in the chat box and I'll help ma'am by reading your answers out. So Ms. Reena says by using flashcards, she raises this child, games for teaching CVC words with actions, Chunk the letters, mapping, introduce the sound of the letters, puzzles, worksheets with pictures, consonant sound of letters, letter dice, by segmenting, blending using magnetic letters, charts in the class, using the hopscotch approach, mapping and flashcards, worksheets with pictures, using flip cards, blending games outdoors, sand tracing activities, missing word approach videos, charts. Yes, uh, I think, um, yeah, it has been a pretty exhaustive list. Yes, uh, they have mentioned all possible uh, things. 
also remember like some of them would need the wave approach you know like we talked about the little car thing or sometimes you need to put the different letters separately and they may need to just trace them along you know go as a wave and sound them along pulling the sounds to blend so basically that's the idea and in whichever way you do it that's fine they just have to uh, all these different approaches do help and the more uh, different kinds of activities you use the learning gets better going to a second case scenario mike is able to blend three letter and four letter words uh, but he has difficulty in writing these words out and spelling them correct so how can we support him so again we are introducing play methods using cvc words game cards blocks sand magnetic cards by tracing on stand, st sand helping with decoding sand writing mapping by using toys void word games into intro to vowels and consonants clap and punch method play <coughs> method play games puzzles and pictures can help flash cards picture worksheets visuals and audio visuals consistent practice going by association repetition drawing concrete letters touch phonics slapping and punching method say and write technique segmenting salt tracing jigsaw flip charts yes more or less all of it ma'am yeah i think uh, pretty pretty exhaustive yes they've uh, gone about doing all this and uh, i just like to add on to this that while they are uh, writing words uh, or while they're trying to spell out word remind them of the rules that they have to follow if it's a sight word just tell them this cannot be sounded out it's a sight word and you can give the blanks for them to map uh, if they are phonetically decodable words or if they can broken into different syllabic units or if you have prefixes suffixes all the different phonetic um word attack strategies if it applies to that particular word you can give those as clues which will help the child to write those and spell those words better so again remember whatever are the activities you do it is constantly uh, getting them to use those strategies that apply to certain words that is important so if the uh, child is able to read the cvcv words but when it comes to writing so remind them remember uh this is the sound that is happening so that means if the word is say is for example if it's a sound um, you know male so just say the word is male so when we are saying m a l remember when the a says a there will be two vowels so think of the two vowel combinations so you know cluing them on to the phonic rules really help so while you do these activities remember always reminding constant reminders uh of uh, what the rule is that they have to follow that kind of helps and with sight words uh, sometimes you have to give the shape of the words because sometimes you know the shape actually helps them to visualize the word uh, better yeah so we come basically to the end of today's workshop um uh, what are the the key take takeaways from today's workshop is reading skills are important for A wide variety of reasons, ranging from you know enjoyment and entertainment, and uh, increasing knowledge and increasing vocabulary, to achieving uh, success in the um, academically in the classroom. Training in phonics and sight words, um, uh, and you know teaching them how to uh, uh, you know learn these words, not to decode, to write, to spell using blending, segmenting, mapping, the other word attack strategies. All these are very important. Uh, which finally adds up to improving their reading fluency their vocabulary and uh, which will ultimately have a, uh, a good positive impact on their writing skills so with that we come to an end of today's workshop um, i hope this has been very useful and it has opened up more avenues on you know what each of you can do in your classrooms now i'm open to q and a Thank you so much, ma'am, for simplifying all of it and making it practical for all of us. As always, I'm <coughs> sure a lot of participants today had a lot to learn from you, which can be applicable to them in their classroom settings. Do you uh, let us know how much you enjoyed today's session and what your favorite part of today's session was? 
before that as you drop in your inputs on the comment box here i like to take you through a few things a lot of people have been asking about today's session the recording of session and the slide deck i'm going to show you where is that you can find all of it this is the place which is the events takeaway where you'll find all the materials the resources the slide deck and also the document associated with today's workshop at one place you'll be able to find the recording of today's session which will be uploaded here post three two to three days of today's session and you'll also receive a mail to claim your certificate not only this by checking out the link for this page which is shared right now in the chat box you'll also find the upcoming events which will be available by as you scroll down do check out all our upcoming events and book your slots for events that is of interest to you because we have very very limited slots if you have benefited from today's event and you have found it very interesting, don't forget to share this event back to anyone who you think would benefit from it. And also remember, you can join us in our mission to spread awareness, to support more children with special needs because a lot of time and effort goes on to producing our events as well as resources. If you have benefited from it, this is the step for you to pay it forward by sharing about our certificate program, our resources, and also by joining us in our mission as an inclusion champion to bring out positive change in the world to support children with special needs. Now, I'd also take you all through our upcoming events, which is on how to teach students with different challenges in a classroom setting, which would be happening on the 29th of January, which would be conducted by Ms. Tobiluba Ajayi, which will happen at 2.30 p.m. Indian time, 4 p.m. Indonesian time, and 5 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. Following that, we have a continuation of the current program where we'll be talking about the building comprehension skills in children with special needs, which will be conducted by none other than Madam Gita Gopi N, which will happen on the 3rd of February, which will happen at 4.30 p.m. Indian time, 6 p.m. Indonesian time, and 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. The link for you to register for all this event will be shared right now in the chat box. Do check them out and register to book your slot because we have very, very limited slots available. And don't forget to share the care by forwarding the link with anyone who you think would benefit from it. Now that I've shared about the events with all of y'all, ma'am, we can begin with our Q&A session for today. Are you ready to take your first question, ma'am? Yes. We have received an overflowing number of questions. Because of the time constraint, we'll take up the questions that will help most of our participants uh, to apply in your settings. The first question is from Ms. Asha and multiple others who want to know, children tend to get confused by using these uh, uh, spelling of words with that of A, E, I, E. How is that we can teach such letters and help them remember where to use what? Uh, can you can you just um, repeat the question, please? I just didn't yeah. get it. Yeah. The children with special needs and also normal children get get confused when they have to use the words which has the letter A E or I E in them, and they tend to confuse the spellings. So how is that we can teach them to understand and remember these spellings specifically? Again, use word families. You know, word families is one of the ways we can do it. And as I said, um, uh, use most of the common words and show how they are different. You know, if, they, uh, if they're having trouble with these, use these two combinations and give a word uh, with that and, you know, do word sorts and so on. So wherever the hitches are coming, you know, uh, if the children are having trouble with, say, A, E and I, E sounds, then use those two uh, word families to, uh, together, give a you know, uh, and then ask them to sort it out. So you're working on uh, targeting on those particular uh, words. So use word families, lots of words with the same word pattern. And if they're confusing between uh, say two things, then you have to uh, work on those. And again, uh, some of the word patterns are very difficult. For example, the er sound, E-R, I-R, U-R, one of the most difficult sound patterns to teach. And um, I have seen that, you know, children who have reading problems, uh, even the ones who are, you know, especially elderly children, they find it very difficult. So what I do is I teach the most common words with them. So for the IR, for example, I use the word like sir or bird. And if it is, uh, you know, uh, the ER words, you know, use the more family words, for example, sister, brother and so on so you know words that they would need to use more commonly in their uh, spoken or written language 
try to give those words for those difficult sounds. With the rest of them, don't worry much. Uh, uh, but you know, try to use a more active vocabulary words. And um, a lot of times, some of these words, uh, you know, even have having them around helps. So uh, you know. For example, if it is, uh, you can label the things in your classroom with these, some of these, uh, you know, words. For example, if the word is um, desk, you know, have put the word desk on the desk in big, you know, uh, a lot of the things in your class or in your home can be labeled uh, so that children can use that also as a, a, reading, uh, a reading exercise. So even just being exposed to those words will help. And as I said, using the dictionary, uh, the dictionary is a big, big thing, especially when they have to write it down. You know, the dictionary is so invaluable. It, it is such a simple thing. Get all the sight words out alphabetically. You can even get them out and stick it on. Uh, also, like in the kit that I have prepared, I've already have a dictionary like that, where all the sight words have been alphabetized. So, you know, when they are uh, supposed to write, ask them to check the dictionary and find the word and then write it. down. So, you know, it, it gives them, a, uh, as I said, they may never become excellent spellers, but at least they know where to look for if they are, uh, you know, to, so that they can arrive at the correct spell. So teaching them that they can look around in the dictionary or do a spell check, that kind of helps. So uh, having you know all these strategies, when done, uh, remediates their problems to a great extent, but it may not totally take the problem. So again, give the most common words. So at least if the common words they can spell correctly, that's fine, <laughs> you know. Thank you so much, ma'am. So the word family is the beginning part to it and making it meaningful for them by connecting it with real life setting is a very, very essential and key. Next, we have a question from Ms. Kingley and multiple others who want to know for children with special needs, they have difficulty in retaining a lot of information. So uh, will it be challenging for them to remember all these rules, the different sounds, how different words to go, to go together? So is it preferable for teachers to go on to teaching them in such lens or make it very functional? What is your take on it, ma'am? It depends, again, it depends on the kind of diagnosis the child has, their cognitive abilities, their intellectual abilities. Um, see, if it is a child um, who has significant challenges in intellectual ability, uh, you know, if they have, say, ID, intellectual disability or global development, sometimes these children, you know, it may not, um, teaching them the rules as such may not help. You know, uh, so you just have to say that, you know, when this pattern appears, this is how you read it. But if it's a child with learning disability, usually with children who have dyslexia and learning disability, they, their intellectual capacity is much higher. So it really helps in teaching them the rules. Because for them, giving the rules is really a hook to which they can hang on to. And uh, nowadays, since we talk about inclusion and we talk about universal ways of teaching children uh, these are all part of universal uh, ways of you know universal design that you teach all this maybe not all of them will grasp on but if uh, from early on when you're introducing these different kids uh, do catch on especially in the early stages they do catch on and uh, the rules yes it is difficult if they have cognitive challenges in fact uh, if they have intellectual uh, challenges, then even phonics also to a, up to a certain point, it works. Beyond that, uh, you know, uh, you may have to introduce more functional reading and functional literacy. So it depends. Again, but, uh, you know, again, do not limit yourself by the thought that the child has intellectual disability. Because see, if they've received early intervention or if they've started receiving this kind of a thing early on, we find they develop much better reading skills. But if they come to us much later on, then yes, the, the possibility of enhancing their reading skills using these methods get, becomes limited. And then we have to move into more of functional uh, reading. 
So understanding the child's strength is very, very important and the child's skills is key to it. And because you're talking about starting all of this early, there are a lot of questions from our participants who want to know how, when is that we can start with blending and segmenting skills. So can we start using blending and segmenting and start teaching them early in years with that of pre-primary level? Or is there any specific grade in which we have to start this with? Normally, we start, we can start in KG2 level. Once they know alphabet phonics, you can start off with um, blending and segmenting skills. No issues. But uh, what I find is see, uh, kids come to us at different levels, different ages. So, for example, if a child has come to me and kind of knows alphabet phonics, but not very thorough, I would still do the alphabet phonics. But while doing the alphabet phonics, say I, I'm working on two or three alphabets. What I normally do is I then uh, take two consonants and a vowel and then do the different word combinations with that. Because see, sometimes a kid comes to us uh, at third grade level. Child is nine years, 10 years, third grade. There is not enough time for you to you know, do one letter. Normally what we would do is have one letter per week in the kindergarten stages. But as if children come to us at a much later stage, we don't have that luxury of time. So you want them to learn the alphabet phonics, but also get to word blending as quickly as possible. So then what I would do is probably in one week, I would introduce two consonants and a vowel. So for example, I would say S and A and probably T. Okay, so I've introduced the sir sound, the ter sound, and the a sound. And I can make different combinations with this. I can make at, I can make as, okay, uh, different combinations with this. So that, you know, right there itself, while I'm teaching the alphabet and the sounds itself, I can teach them that we can blend it and form words. But if the children come to you early on, you have the luxury of time. So you can slowly work on the alphabet phonics once they're thorough with that then like we do with regular kids, we can move on to blending and segmenting. But uh, in our remedian clinics, what happens is something different happens like this. So, uh, or sometimes what I do is I start off, if the child comes to us early, we've done a letter a week. We've, uh, you know, uh, over 26 weeks we've done till Z, but we know that the child is not completely steady and the child needs rehearsal. But then it gets boring if you go back to one letter a week again. So once we've done that, what I do is, again, I go back to ABC, but then I introduce, as I said, because the child by then will have some hang of some of the alphabet points. So then I go to, I pick out uh, two vowels, uh, two consonants and a vowel, so I can straight away go on to uh, CBC words. So I will still revise the alphabets, but I will start with some blending and segmenting then. Thank you because, so much. Uh, as I said, you know, repetition and rehearsing periodically is very important. So even if the children go to a certain level, I still have, I usually begin my, uh, most of my remedial reading sessions with, either they have a desk card where they have to read all the letters and their sounds, because that, that starts as a warm up activity, or they have to, if they're very, if they're more tactile learners, then I get them to, uh, you know, put out all the letters A to Z. And then I ask them to bring down different letters and, you know, build the word, whatever I'm asking or whatever I'm focusing on. So the ABC is still revised, but we move on to blending and segmenting. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your expertise and your practical experiences with all of us. This will help much of our educators out here. Next, we have a question from Ms. Tumbetan and Suchitra, who wants to know the child is proficient in reading because of regular reading practices, but finds it very difficult to write the right spelling. So what can be done in such situations? Uh, I think I've already mentioned that in the workshop already, you know, give the mapping, uh, give the blanks get the child to uh, build using, if it is a phonetically decodable word, remind them of the rule and give the blanks so that they can visualize the word. So if it's a big, uh, as I said, uh, think of what the word is. If it is a blend, then give two blanks for the blend and put it in a circle. Give those visual cues so that it helps the child to spell out better. And you know, point to those uh, blanks while you're saying the sounds. 
so that it helps the child to uh, put those words, map those, uh, you know, the sound, the phonemes onto the blanks. That really helps, especially if they can read and if they are unable to spell it out. Yes, if they are phonetically decodable words. Otherwise, you know, use your dictionaries and word walls if they are not phonetically. So using the mapping technique is the way to go about it. Next, we have a question from Ms. Dorothy who wants to know, children with dyslexia or learning challenges struggle with sound recognition. Teaching the long and short vowel sound to these children is very hard and it confuses them to remember all this and fluently read. What can be done to encourage them to continue to read because they tend to lose motivation after trying it for a few times. So what can we do as educators to make it interesting and keep them motivated? Uh, see, uh, this is why I said, you know, even in, during the workshop, I did say, if they have decoded, they have taken a lot of effort to decode the word, right? So then give a break, get them to draw the picture or get them to color the picture if it is there, if the picture is already there in the worksheet. That breaks that, you know, it helps de-stress them. If you're actually doing it, uh, sometimes what I do it uh, is I, uh, we take turns, if it, especially if it's a remedial session. Sometimes once they read and uh, I ask them to read, the next time I take the other, uh, you know, I take the other role. So I read and they listen. So, you know, giving the, especially when the chunks of reading get larger and larger, uh, sometimes we have to do this because with children with dyslexia, especially, after a bit of reading, because it's very effortful reading. They need a break, you know, they get exhausted. There's a something called reading fatigue that sets in. So to avoid that fatigue, you need to, uh, you need to be very observant as an educator to see if the child is really getting exhausted. If the child is getting exhausted, then let the child let off the reading for a bit and you do other activities. Or you can do the reading and the child can listen for some time. And then you can do some oral activities. Uh, based on that and uh, so that is why you break that monotony of, of having to read for extended lengths of time uh, teaching the phonic rules especially with dyslexic children it actually helps only thing you have to teach it in a very systematic manner you teach it in a systematic manner if you keep reminding them uh, of these uh, of the rules while they are reading if they get stuck at words in a systematic manner it actually helps them to read better eventually uh, especially with LD children and dyslexia and all this, they, it actually helps them uh, because th that gives them some kind of a structure to go back to when they are encountering these words. So that actually helps. I, I, I mean, I can vouch for that for my 30 years of experience that actually teaching the rules do help, uh, especially to children with dyslexia. But yes, reading fatigue is there. And um, also you have to understand if there is large chunks of reading, then either you have to alternate and give the child a break or you have to use other accommodations. So you can use audio text and so on so that the child, instead of having to read continuously themselves, they can uh, listen to the audio version of the text and follow the text. That helps. And that comes especially when they are into higher grades. You know, uh, no matter how well they read, they, it is still effortful. Uh, you may not see the struggle if they've got good remediation and they, they've developed, but that, uh, you know, what somebody else does very easily, they do it with a lot of effort. So that really uh, brings about a fatigue. And that is why when they go into, especially into higher classes, even if they can read well, we ask them to uh, um, have audio text. Because uh, otherwise, what normally happens is because of the reading struggle, they tend not to study. To avoid study, so to uh, to uh, to uh, minimize the reading struggle and to maximize the study skills, we then introduce audio versions, audio texts. Thank you so much, ma'am. So breaking the monotony using a variety of activity and also using it providing breaks is very very important. Keeping the time in the mind, I'll take the last question for today, which is on: Is there any ideal structure to teach? different syllabic rules to children with special needs. Can educators start to begin with CVC word or is there any different combinations that they have to keep in mind while teaching children with special needs? This is a question from Mr. Nelson. Uh, 
I usually start with CVC words because most of the CVC words can be picturized. That is one because reading and comprehension have to go hand in hand. So uh, that is why I usually start with CVC words because uh, along with CVC words, if you introduce some sight words, then you can also make it into sentences and make it into stories. Uh, so, uh, uh, so ultimately, uh, it's not just word decoding, it is also comprehending that is important. So that is why uh, starting with CVC words helps because it helps target, introduce some sight words along with it to form uh, not just to form words, but also to form sentences and stories and uh, facilitate comprehension. Uh, also, the other thing is um, usually after CVC words, we go on to long vowels. And uh, generally, we, I find most of the reading schemes, if you look at most of the reading schemes, they go to the, uh, the silent E combination, the A, you know, like the make, bike combination, the silent E coming at the end. Most of the reading schemes follow that. Depends on what reading scheme you're following. Uh, as long as you teach it in a certain systematic way, that is all that matters. But usually most of the schemes I find go through this pattern. You know, they start off with uh, uh, the easy, uh, the CVC words and then move on to the, uh, the long vowels. And, and as I said, the blends and diagrams, Usually what happens is after a lot of the sight words, uh, after uh, the CVC words, before the sight, uh, the long vowels, sometimes the blends are introduced. The blends and some of the diagraphs are introduced and then the long vowels are started. This is the regular pattern generally in most of the reading schemes in, uh, across the world. Uh, but uh, as I said, when children come to us for remediation, we may have to use different kinds of comments because uh, they might have already lost out on time. So, you know, uh, if the child, as I said, you know, along with the CVC itself, you might throw in a blend and a diagraph if the child is ready to take it out. So that you don't have to waste extra time for the blends and diagraphs separately. But if the child is very young, then this is an, usually most of the reading schemes follow this pattern. Because uh, roughly speaking, in the regular, if you look at most of the regular red reading schemes, uh, grade uh, by grade uh, uh, sec, uh, upper kg or kg two, usually they start with the basic blending and segmenting uh, with the CVC words. It can and some sight words are introduced, and then in grade one, actually uh, the most of the all the short vowels and uh, many sight words are introduced. The long vowels are just, uh, so the short vowels are strengthened. It is introduced, started, uh, they start to introduce it in KG, and then it is further reinforced in grade one. And then in uh, towards the end of grade one, the, uh, the you know, some of the blends, diagraphs, and uh, some of the long vowels are introduced. And then in grade two, again, the long vowels are taken up and it is further reinforced. So that how, that's how the pattern goes. In, with most of the reading schemes. Uh, so it depends on what curriculum or what reading scheme you're following. Uh, it doesn't matter, the order doesn't really matter. CVC words, yes, and then the long vowel, whatever. But if there is a particular reading scheme, they will have a certain pattern. So, you know, if you follow that pattern, it will hit out at all the, it will touch upon all the phonetic schemes uh, and all the sites. So following the reading scheme or the curriculum, that's very important and customizing it for the child of children with special needs is also very, very crucial to take the pattern across. So thank you so much, ma'am, for a wonderful session and making it very, very practical for all of us and illuminating all our educators out here so that we can make a difference in our classroom to support children with special needs. I'd like to check with you your final words to all our participants today, ma'am. I think they've been an extremely enlightened audience um, considering the, all the feedback that they were giving uh, during the case study scenarios. They're all very, very thinking educators and you know, um, and I'm sure they're doing wonderful work wherever they are. So uh, it's, it's, it's always lovely to talk to such an engaged community. So thank you for providing such a wonderful platform, Ibliti as well, uh, you know, in giving me such a, uh, you know, helping to share whatever little I know and whatever I can get from them as well. Because some of their uh, suggestions have been extremely, you know, very positive and very uh, to the point. 
So that's really nice. So thank you, uh, Ability, as well as the participants for such an engaging session. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you all at the audience for being active and participating throughout today's session and making it very engaging and interactive. I've seen that the feedback link has been shared with you all already. I'll request my team members to again post this feedback link in the chat box. Do take a moment out and let us know how effective this session has been for you so that we will be able to improve the experience for all of you all. And before signing off today, I'd like to reiterate to all of you that we have an upcoming session on how to teach students with different challenges in a classroom setting, which should be happening on the 29th of January by Ms. Tobiloba Ajayi at 2.30 p.m. Indian time, 4 p.m. Indonesian time, and 5 p.m. Singapore or Philippines time. Followed by that, we have another session on building comprehension skills in children with special needs, which would be happening on the 3rd of February and be conducted by Madam Geeta Gopi N at 4.30 p.m. Indian time, 6 p.m. Indonesian time, 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. Don't forget to register yourself and book your slots today because we have limited slots available. And also don't forget to share the care with anyone and do forward the link to anyone who you think would benefit from it. Until we see you for the next time, it's a big bye from Team Ability. Stay safe, take care all of you.